Reprise de Bar, the Honorable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this motion is all about the struggle for the vote, and I think it's important for this place to be reminded that it was not until 1918 that women could finally vote in the federal election. I would like to credit Alberta's own Nellie McClung for her strong efforts across the country to ensure that women could uh, exercise their suffrage at the provincial, the local, and the federal level. It was not until 1960 that Canada's First Nations peoples were allowed to vote uh, without, with no strings attached, without giving up, up their, uh, their Aboriginal rights. There has been broad concern, as many in this place have mentioned, uh, across Canada for the decreasing voter turnout. So the last thing that we would expect the government of the day to do is to put in place measures that would further put barriers in place to make it difficult for people to exercise their franchise. Mr. Speaker, an open, fair and inclusive electoral system is the foundation of a modern democracy. The right to vote is now enshrined in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, not a minor matter. As Jean-Pierre Kingsley has been quoted to say, Mr. Speaker, in quotes, Canada's electoral system is often mentioned as an international model for both its fairness and effectiveness, end of quotes. Canadians have, because of a reputation of a credible electoral system, been invited to serve as election monitors in elections around the world, notably recently in Ukraine. I had the privilege in 2012 of uh, attending in Ukraine to help to monitor that election. Other members attended again uh, uh, last December, and uh, we are going to be welcoming those invitations again. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just had the privilege in the last week of traveling to two African countries with uh, colleagues of this place, uh, to Mozambique and Madagascar. And those two nations who are struggling, lesser developed nations, having gone through war, have extreme poverty, have actually established electoral commissions and are bending over backwards to reach out and to educate the populace, to get them enumerated and to enable them to vote. Um, and here we are in reverse. Um, Perhaps we should be shamefaced going overseas and professing to have expertise in the democratic electoral process when in fact this government is moving in a more regressive version rather than, provide, than looking. Perhaps now we're going to have to have election monitors here to give us encouragement on how we can make our process more democratic. So today we have a motion put forward by the member for Toronto Danforth uh, that an opinion changes to the Electoral Act proposed by this government to prohibit vouching uh, prohibit ele voter election, uh, e voter education programming by Elections Canada and the use of voter ID. And the concern is, Mr. Speaker, that that will disenfranchise first-time voters like youth and new Canadians, Aboriginal Canadians and our seniors living in residence. Um, I wish first, Mr. Speaker, to speak to the process deployed in the passage of these proposed election laws. Um, the reforms were long awaited. Uh, many times the government stood, uh, the ministers of the time stood in their place and said, any day now I'm going to table this election law, and then, and then they would withdraw it. And so we've been waiting for quite some time because everyone agrees in this place that we do need some reforms to the law um, going forward to the next uh, coming election uh, within a year, a year and a half, and it's important that we have enough time to have these laws in place, elections can to be ready for them. So the question is, why now the rush? Having waited so long to bring forward these long-awaited changes, they bring these forward uh, with no consultation with Elections Canada, which is a break. It's in a breach of the protocol of past. It is also a breach of past protocol of consultations among all of the parties. Again, in my visit to these developing African nations, those nations, those governments have reached out to their opposition members. So what kind of example is this government uh, setting? Why the need to fast track this bill through? The reasonable request was made to have this bill immediately go to committee so that more substantial amendments could be made. We had the public calling for, for uh, more time to consult and there have been calls by our party to take this bill across Canada. Let's hear from Canadians, all of which has been denied. Well, despite uh, the significant issues identified, um, we're rushing through this bill, and so we are pleading once again to the government to apply some common sense, some dignity, some democratic process 
to the reform of the most critical law in our nation, the right to exercise your franchise. I would like to speak to a couple of issues under the bill that are raised in the motion. One is the proposed prohibition of vouching and any reliance on voter ID cards. Um, as has been mentioned by many of my colleagues, um, in past there has been some level of reliance on vouching. Why is that? Because there's some members of our society who simply do not have readily available to them identification. Um, I can certainly speak to in uh, my riding of Edmonton Strathcona uh, within the city of Edmonton and Alberta. It's well known in this country and the government of the day brags all the time about all of the work that's being created in Alberta and, and suggesting that people should move to Alberta because they're their jobs and we're welcoming people from other countries into Canada to work in Alberta, in many cases in the oil sands. And so we have an incredibly mobile population. And I can attest to the fact that going door to door in three successive elections, innumerable numbers of people who had just moved in, who had moved across the city and relocated, had uh, uh, no mail with their address, uh, uh, no license uh, with their new address and so forth. And so, you know, household after household were giving out information on how they can actually be enumerated. Very serious problems if, if uh, we take away the ID cards and particularly if we take away the vouching. I can also attest, Mr. Speaker, to the fact of the serious concern by the university students in my riding. I'm privileged to have uh, three university campuses and an additional campus across the river in, in other ridings. And I've received letters from the Students' Union from Gretna McEwen University, University of Alberta, and King's University. Those students' unions all voicing deep concern about the re removal of the opportunity for vouching. Why? Because in many circumstances, as many have attested to, students will share a residence and only one name will be on the lease or one name will be on the bills that come to the house. And so they have no way of proving um, that place of residence. I can attest to the fact that I personally have seen young students coming to vote in polls in my riding and being turned away. Uh, where parents arrive with them and they're still turned away. Uh, many cases where students have been misinformed and told, you must vote in the town you come from. You can't vote here simply because you're going to university. So we need to move in the direction, Mr. Speaker, of enabling our youth to vote, not discouraging them. Secondly, the category of First Nation peoples. Uh, in my city, there are many First Nations peoples that sadly are displaced, are homeless, um, even though the city is trying to address that. And there are wonderful services, including the Boyle Street Society, who at the time of election uh, come forward and assist these, these homeless people and vouch for them and enable them to vote. And they have personally expressed to me uh, deep sadness that by uh, banning the vouching, that these people who are trying to get their act together and to exercise their rights are going to be demand, uh, banned that opportunity. Additionally, as I'm sure all the other members of this place have, there are many seniors residences, many long-term uh, care uh, institutions. We are told by uh, the operators of these institutes that on many, many, many occasions, they have to vouch for the residents of these institutions so that those uh, residents can vote. So the obvious question, Mr. Speaker, is why is the government moving to disenfranchise these voters? Uh, we have not heard one credible, rational argument for this. Um, we should be encouraging people to vote. Uh, we, of course, uh, heard the government try to defend that um, this practice has to be uh, undone because Mr. Newfeld, who was commissioned by Elections Canada to advise on re reviewing the Act, had said, oh, there's all of this fraud and vouching, you need to remove it. And he has clearly stated um, that at, he was adamant at no time did he suggest ineligible voters have deliberately tried to cast illegal ballots. The only information we provided to this House was information that misled the House and has since been withdrawn. So we still await what is the rationale for disenfranchising over 100,000 voters. Um, finally, I would like to uh, simply mention on the voter education, um, the public, uh, many experts and certainly my colleagues are stunned that the government is choosing to diminish the powers and mandate of the chief, chief electoral officer and his officers to educate and encourage the public to vote. And final point, I am absolutely dismayed 
at the decision to deny the strongest recommendation of Mr. Mayrand, and that is to give him the powers of investigation to compel evidence. And Mr. Speaker, there can only be two reasons for this, both of which are reprehensible. One is the government is intentionally blocking the ability of Elections Canada to enforce the Act, or the second one is they simply do not understand the enforcement system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Testimony come on tide. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to pick up on the member's uh, last point because in the uh, NDP opposition motion, they make reference to the prohibiting of vouching and voter education uh, programming. Um, we in the Liberal Party have been very clear in terms of the issue of compelling. Uh, we believe that Elections Canada should have the ability to compel people to testify. As a result of them not having that ability, one of the issues that has surfaced from the last election was the issue of overspending. Um, and the government not, or Elections Canada not being able to compel witnesses does pose problems uh, for Elections Canada in order to get to the truth of the matter. And my question to, to the member is, maybe she can just kind of expand, because she just started it uh, in her, at her last uh, sentence or two, in regards to the idea of compelling a witness, especially in a, ask her maybe to make reference to the importance of um, not overspending, as, as an example. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I don't want to get into the detail of the specific offence, but I do want to speak to the issue of a credible enforcement system. Um, I speak with some experience because I've worked in the field for quite some time in my professional career. Um, there are many components to effective enforcement system. One is that you have to have clear uh, offences, and as the government has done, they've increased the penalties. But if you don't have the requisite powers to investigate, you cannot bring cases forward and therefore impose penalties. So regardless of what the offence may be, whether it's fraud, whether it's overspending, whether it's uh, illegal robocalls and so forth, it doesn't really matter what the offence is, and it doesn't matter if you increasingly impose the potential for stricter penalties. If the officers do not have the requisite necessary powers and mandate to compel information and testimony, then you're simply not going to proceed with effective cases. Questions and comments? Kestoni Kamantai, the Honourable Member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for setting out so clearly um, some of the issues at stake and, and if, I, if she would indulge me just to read a quick passage from um, the Chief Electoral Officer Mark Mayron's testimony before the Procedure and House Affairs Committee where he gives very concrete examples drawn from the real world uh, and Elections Canada's knowledge about where vouching, some examples, these are only some examples of where vouching is used and ask whether or not you think there's any reason to disbelieve this. Quote, in the case of seniors, it's not uncommon for one of the spouses to drive and to have all the bills in their name. Right now, the other spouse can be vouched for by their partner. Similarly, seniors living with their children often must be vouched for by one of the children in order to be able to vote. The reverse is also true. Young Canadians often live at home where students move frequently. They sometimes have no documents to prove their current residential address. First Nations electors on reserve also face challenges as the Indian status card does not include address information. For many of these electors, vouching by another elector is the only option. Expanding the list of ID documents will not assist them improving their address. End of quotation. And you spoke a lot about the mobile society we live in, and we've been listening all day to Conservative MPs um, almost pretending that this, these situations don't exist. And I'm wondering if you think uh, there's reason to dis disbelieve the Chief Electoral Officer. The Honourable Member for Edmund Strathcona, uh, I commend to all members of the House the uh, reminder that uh, they address their questions and comments to the uh, Chair, not to other members. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd be pleased to address my response to you. I'd like to thank, nonetheless, the Member for his question. Um, as the Member will have heard in my brief remarks, in fact, those scenarios I have run into in my riding and have, have heard assertions from campaign members and since, from students, from people assisting the homeless, uh, those working with First Nations directly from First Nations and from seniors, and I have received letters and calls from constituents deeply concerned that all of those categories of people 
um, homeless people, Aboriginal people, particularly in uh, in uh, isolated communities, uh, all kinds of categories, and particularly in my city, um, there is such a mobile population, such an influx of new people, and. Uh, simply busy adjusting, trying to get their children into school and so forth, um, hard enough to find out that they have a right to vote, let alone where they vote, and then uh, what kind of information they can provide. So certainly huge categories, and I absolutely have no cause to question um, the word of Mr. Mayrand.